what usually happens is then um, the math, if it's a good theory, it tells you the limits of that theory. Einstein's theory, when you combine it with quantum theory, quantum field theory, tells you very explicitly that space time has no operational meaning beneath 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, the, the Planck scale, and 10 to the minus 40. So what, what is interesting is the philosophers will say this is self-refuting again. There's a theory of space time in which everybody believes space time is fundamental, and it comes out and says, no, space time isn't fundamental. It doesn't even make sense at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and below. Well, that's the way science works. A good theory comes back and tells you its own limits. That's the glory of science. And it's not self-refuting. It, it, it's in the nature of theories. Girdle tells us that it's in the nature of theories that no theory can tell you all the truth. There it is no theory of everything. And a good theory is one that um, tells you where the concepts that you use to boot up the theory reach their limits. And then what you do is you look for a deeper framework and, and you show that the old, so you don't throw away your old theory, but you show how the old theory is now a special case of a, of a deeper framework. Donald Hoffman is a cognitive psychologist, a professor at UC Irvine, and author of the recent book, The Case Against Reality, where he makes the case that evolution may not have tuned us to see reality as it is. Uh, Donald Hoffman's works on perception and consciousness are incredibly, incredibly important and interesting to dive deep into. Here, we talk about his interface theory of perception, the idea of looking at perception as a constructive interface rather than a window or some traditional metaphor. Uh, we talk about finding structures deeper than space-time and what implications that has for consciousness, we talk about consciousness and consciousness theories, as well as a bit about uh, contemplative spiritual traditions and what role they might have to play in this whole conversation. Um, as an aside, if you like these conversations and would like to would like them to continue, please consider subscribing to the channel. That really helps us out. Um, I wouldn't ask you to like it. I think that's a bit too far. Here is my conversation with Donald. How did you become interested in perception? Well, I took some courses at UCLA when I was an undergraduate at upper division courses where I started learning about visual perception and found the visual neurophysiology quite interesting. I was stunned to hear all the amazing properties of the receptive fields of, of neurons and visual cortex. Uh, and then my senior year at UCLA, I um, found out about the work of David Marr who was a professor at MIT in the Artificial Intelligence Lab and what's now the Brain and Cognitive Science Department. And his work um, seemed to really integrate, of course, a good knowledge of neurophysiology because he had a PhD in that, but also trying to build systems that actually could see. So he actually to build working visual systems. And I thought that was a really good combination uh, to understand the visual neurophysiology uh, and then to also then understand the artificial intelligence side of things. So, so that, that really grabbed my attention. And I was, so I went to MIT. I was fortunate to get to work with David for, for, for a while at, at MIT and, and the AI lab there. And so, so that was what really grabbed my interest. So it was some good classes at, when I was an undergrad at, at UCLA. Right. No, uh, David Marr's three levels of analysis, amongst other things just seem like it has to be right. Yeah, I, I like his three level, three levels of analysis, the computational theory, algorithm, and hardware implementation kind of idea. I think that that's a really good intellectual framework to think a, a, about a, a lot of problems. And, and Mar, you know, he, he was a genius and he was a, a wonderful advisor. Also, I, I was co-advised with Whitman Richards, who was you know, all, all at MIT there. And so the two of them were just wonderful advisors. And yeah, you know, his, Mars book Vision was a, a landmark in, in the whole field of, of, of visual science. So, uh, and the group that he assembled there at MIT was, was stunning. I, I was very, very lucky. And I knew at the time I was very, very lucky to be at, at this, this pivotal point in, in the, the history of, of visual um, science. So, so yeah, it's Mar really, um, he, he's, his good writing was what grabbed my attention as an undergrad and, and sort of moved me into the field. I, I, I was interested in this whole area anyway, but but Mar really sort of, he put he brought it all together and got all my interest. So that's why I went there. Was it that that Mar's work expanded the sort of, um, the, like the bridge between theory and practice here that 
Mars work provided a framework for how you could start building systems and sort of transcend the boundaries between computer science and neuroscience. Yes. So, I mean, I was very impressed with what the neurophysiologists were finding, but but there, as we know, that there's you know, billions and billions of cells in, in, in the brain and, and, and in the visual cortex, so billions of cells there. So, uh, you know, that's understanding what they're doing is very, very difficult. And, and I'm not interested in, you know, people just waving their hands and saying, maybe this, maybe that. And what I loved about Mars approach was um, there was this no nonsense approach. If you think you know how it works, build it. And if you can build it and it works, then maybe you're onto something. If you can't build it, I have no time for your for your ideas. And I, I thought that was exactly the right kind of no nonsense idea. So 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 anybody can speculate about how systems might work or how the visual system is working. But uh, you know, if you turn that speculation into a working system, it doesn't mean you're right, but it, at least uh, it means you're probably serious enough that we should look into what you've done. <laughs> so I like that hard nosed attitude. Right. Right. Okay. So diving into the meat of your work. Um, uh, uh, so what is the, the interface theory of perception and how did you come up with it? Well, so the interface theory of perception is very, very different from what my advisor, David Marr had in mind, right? So Marr thought that um, for simple systems like the fly, the, the visual systems probably uh, had evolved just to give simple signals that guided, uh, you know, the motor commands to the wings and so forth, but no real insight into the nature of objective reality. So they, they weren't, their, their visual systems weren't there to show them the truth. It was really just the strict guide adaptive behavior kind of attitude that you'd expect from evolutionary theory. But, but Mar thought, and in his book <clears throat> Vision, he talks about this, that he thought that in the case of humans, <clears throat> we'd evolved, um, and then shaped by natural selection to see, for example, the true shapes of, of surfaces, of objects around us. <clears throat> so, and also the distances to them. So, so Mar thought that um, we were seeing the truth when we saw objects. I mean, to see that there is an object would be seeing a truthful thing and seeing the shape of the object and the, and the distance, we would in the normal case be having a veridical perception. Of course, he understood that we could easily have misperceptions now and then, but he thought in the normal case, we saw reality as it is <clears throat> and and you know he was my advisor and i believed him um, for for many many years but as i started to look at evolutionary theory a little bit more closely um, it became clear that evolutionary theory does entail that sensory systems evolved to guide adaptive behavior that's clear that you know sensory systems that help you survive long enough to reproduce will be more likely to um, evolve than those that don't. So, and so it's there to guide adaptive behavior. So Mars claim, and, and the claim of many of my colleagues, that in addition to what evolution tells us clearly that sensory systems evolved to shape our sensory systems, uh, evolution shaped our sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. In addition to that saying, in addition, they've been shaped to see the truth. That is an extra claim that um, when I thought about it, it wasn't obvious. And, and the more I thought about it, it, it became problematic because you know, so, you know, guiding adaptive behavior is clear. Seeing the truth is something people are just adding on to that. So, so I decided at some point to, to, to look into that. And I, I first, um, you know, I, I wrote a book called Visual Intelligence, How We Create What We See. And so I, I, I looked um, at in detail at how we construct shapes and colors and so forth. I didn't talk about evolution too much in that book, um, but it was in the back of my mind. Um, but, but after that, I decided in uh, around 2006, 2007, that uh, this was a big enough issue in my field. And, and my concerns about the standard view that we see reality as it is, um, weren't being addressed in, in a rigorous manner. Uh, and evolutionary theory is a, a mathematically rigorous theory. So we, we shouldn't just wave our hands and say what we want. We, we should get some theorems. So I decided first just to do, run some simulations. So my graduate students and I in 2010 published a paper um, in the Journal of Theoretical Biology um, where we ran some simulations that um, confirmed that 
what I my initial idea was that well maybe you know seeing the truth would just be too time consuming and take too much energetic resources so evolution does things cheaply and quickly in many cases because it takes less calories and less time so so it wasn't a very deep idea but I thought well if we've been shaped to to do things quickly and cheaply maybe we cut corners and we don't see that you know we wouldn't we wouldn't see the truth um and and it turns out that that's that's the case but our simulations tipped me off um, one of my students uh, brian Merring, was the one who really pointed this out to me that what was really the interesting thing of, co of course you know the doing things fast and quick and cheap were, was fine that, that 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 did make us cut corners on the truth but the real thing was that the fitness payoff functions that guide evolution might not have information about the true structure of the world and when they don't have information about the true structure of the world then when you're shaped you know when your senses are shaped by a fitness payoff function that has no information about the structure of the world then your sensory systems won't be able to be shaped to that structure of the world because there was no information to shape them to that and so so that so that was the real tip off. Okay, so some fitness payoff functions might not have information about the structure of the world. Wow, in that case, we wouldn't see. So what's the probability? What's the probability that a fitness payoff function that's shaping the sensory system will have information about the structure of the world? I mean, that seemed like a pretty important. So I, I went and worked with um, mathematician Chaitan Prakash and uh, some other colleagues, uh, Manish Singh, Robert Prentner, um, Chris Fields and others. Um, and we we looked at this. I should also thank Jeff Iverson, who who had been a big help in some of the mathematics on this and uh, uh, and Justin Mark, who did some of the simulations. So I don't want to leave anybody out here. There's a lot of so it wasn't me. It was a whole team of us. But what what Chaitan and I really worked on was what is okay what, can we give a general argument what's the probability that a payoff function will have information about a structure in the world like a total order like um the amount the percentage of oxygen in the air might be one percent two percent three percent that's a total order one two three are, are numbers that are totally ordered um so that's a total order or a metric or topology there, there's all sorts of structures that the world might have that you might want a sensory system to be tuned to so could we frame a combinatorial argument about this? And we did, and, and it turns out that um, if you, the evolutionary theory gives us no reason to prefer any one payoff function over another, right? So, so, so I, and I should say a payoff function depends on the state of the world, right? You know, whatever the world might be. Um, it also depends on the organism but what's good for me is not good for a benthic fish and vice versa. Being 5,000 meters underwater is really bad for Hoffman. It could be really great for a benthic fish. So, so the payoff is gonna depend on the world and the organism, the state of the organism, whether you're hungry or, for example, or not hungry. And what, what the action is, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating, the, the famous four Fs. So, um, so, it, so they're complicated functions, but evolutionary theory just says, um, there is some fitness payoff function. It puts no restriction on the nature of that payoff function. Now, a future version of evolutionary theory might, but right now, or there is no, there is no, you know, restriction on these functions. So, what we decided is okay. Let's we let's suppose the world, whatever the world is, we don't need to assume we know what the structure is. But the world has n, say, um, m m states. So m is in Mary. And our fitness payoff values like might be from zero to hundred. Zero means you're dead. Hundred is the best possible payoff. And so, we're, so n is a Nancy possible payoff values, and we can then literally then count the number of payoff functions. Right? It's um, uh, so it's it's n to the m um, possible payoff functions. And then you can, for any particular structure in the world that you might think about, so say a total order, you can then say out of these uh, n to the m payoff, total payoff functions, how many of them um, are 
what we call homomorphisms of the the structure in the world so uh, say a total order or topology whatever it might be and you, you can count them right you can when you want, if you do the math you can count them so then you can just um, put the total number of the homomorphisms the ones that have information about the structure of the world put that in the numerator of a fraction and put the total number of payoff functions in the denominator and then take the limit as the number of states of the world goes larger and larger to infinity and the number of payoff values goes larger and larger to infinity and so and you get a clean answer in every case the probability is zero precisely that that um, a randomly chosen payoff function um, would have would be a homomorphism that i .e. have information about the structure in the world so it's a it's a pretty devastating argument right that that, that how could evolution shape our senses to see the truth if the fitness functions that are doing the shaping don't know the truth themselves, almost surely they don't know the truth. So now that's, I'm not saying that that's the final word in evolutionary theory. Someone could propose a change to the theory of evolution of natural selection. They could say, well, here's this new principle that um, we need to add to evolutionary theory that, that shows that there's a bias, that the, the fitness payoff functions that we're likely to encounter are biased toward ones that see the truth. Now, I'm perfectly open for someone to to make that extension, but that that is not our current evolutionary theory. There there is nothing like that on, on the table. So so if someone wanted to make a, a concrete proposal, they would have to give a principled reason why there is this bias. And I've not seen that on offer so far. So so as it stands with our current evolutionary theory, um, the probability is zero that any sensory system of any organism has ever been shaped to see any aspect of the structure of objective reality. And notice I don't need to know what objective reality is, right? And, and, and this argument also, I mean, a counter that I get to this argument is that it's, you know, Hoffman, you're, you're, self, you're, you're refuting yourself. Evolutionary theory assumes a physical world um, with organisms that are physical objects and, and, and things like apples that have definite you know, properties and shapes. And, and so you're using evolutionary theory, which assumes that, the, that, we're, that we know truthfully that there are organisms and knows truthfully that there are, there are resources like apples. We know truthfully that there is space and time and so forth. And you start with that. And so you have to be refuting yourself if you use that theory to conclude that, that um, we're not seeing the truth. Uh, and, and so that the whole thing about uh, objects in space time is. And, and my answer to that is, and I should say that, I mean, this is not just casual. I mean, uh, there's a, a philosophy um, PhD who part of his dissertation last July or June um, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, Took, took this on and argued that, that I have to be self-refuting because I have to have false beliefs. I, if I believe that, you know, the mathematics of, you know, um, uni universal Darwinism, which is, you know, using evolutionary game theory. So it's the mathematical model of, 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 of evolution. Um, if, if I believe that that, if I don't believe that that is a good model of evolutionary theory, then of course I shouldn't be able to use it to get my conclusion, right? So, but if I do believe that the math, um, is, is a good model of evolutionary theory, then I, then I, and, and evolutionary theory is, is um, an, an instance of this mathematics. So it's a good instance of this um, universal Darwinism. Then I'm committed to the, uh, the ontology of, of evolutionary theory. And so I'm going to refute myself when I end up denying that, that ontology. And, and my answer is, it doesn't matter what Hoffman believes. That's irrelevant. Well, it's, there's a mathematical theory on the table. It's called evolutionary game theory. There's evolutionary graph theory. Now, is it the final word? No. It's the best word we have so far. So as a scientist, for better or for worse, I'm saying this is what science has to offer right now. Evolutionary game theory. Do I believe it? Irrelevant what Hoffman believes. Who gives a rip? Who could care less what Hoffman believes about the ontology of, of evolution or, or the evolutionary game theory is, who, who gives a rip? All I care about is there's this mathematical theory that's out there, it's the state of the art, it's the best we got. I wanna look at the structure of that mathematics. 
and see what it entails. Does it entail um, that uh, there's a high probability we're shaped to see reality as it is or not? And when you look at that mathematics, the, the answer is very, very clear. The probability is zero. And, and by analogy, um, take Einstein. Einstein believed in space-time. He thought space-time was fundamental. And uh, in 1905, he put down the equations for flat space-time, special relativity. And in 1915, 10 years later, he put down the equations for curved space-time. And he believed space-time was fundamental and smooth and, and so forth. Um, but we found out uh, when we took his equations and um, used them with even, even just his equations alone, we found that all this, space time isn't smooth. It, it, it could have black holes. Einstein didn't expect that. He didn't like it. He didn't believe it for a while. So, so Einstein was not a believer in the output of his own equations. So, so that's the way science works. It, you don't need to give a rip about what the individuals believe look at the math, look at the implications of the math. That's how we move forward. So, so this bit about, well, you have to be, you know, your beliefs are important and you can get yourself in logical conclusions. No, 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 that, that, that's, that's, that's not how science works. Your beliefs are your beliefs and you get your ideas over beer, wherever you might get them from watching Netflix. You, you get your beliefs and it, the, the bottom line is who cares? You get a mathematical theory. Now the math is there and the math is there with its own implications and you look at it. And what usually happens is then um, the math, if it's a good theory, it tells you the limits of that theory. Einstein's theory, when you combine it with quantum theory, quantum field theory, tells you very explicitly that space-time has no operational meaning beneath 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, the, the Planck scale, and 10 to the minus 40. So what, what's is interesting is the philosophers will say this is self-refuting again. There's a theory of space-time in which everybody believes space-time is fundamental, and it comes out and says, no, space-time isn't fundamental. It doesn't even make sense at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and below. Well, that's the way science works. A good theory comes back and tells you its own limits. That's the glory of science. And it's not self-refuting. It, it, it's in the nature of theories. Gödel tells us that it's in the nature of theories that no theory can tell you all the truths. There it is no theory of everything. And a good theory is one that um, tells you where the concepts that you use to boot up the theory reach their limits. And then what you do is you look for a deeper framework and, and you show that the old, so you don't throw away your old theory, but you show how the old theory is now a special case of a, of a deeper framework. So, so I, I think that I would love to find a deeper framework in, in, uh, in which evolutionary theory evolves as a special case and also a deeper framework in which space-time evolves as a special case. So we don't throw away those theories. We, we keep them um, as special cases that were really important guides to the later work. Right. Absolutely. I think, I mean, just the, the question that you put forward, I think it can't be dismissed, right? That people might disagree with things like uh, the weight of the functions or the specific strategies and how you model them. But just the base question that evolution should have something to say here, that there's a question of whether trade-offs have some homomorphism with structures out in the world. It's a very clean question. And it's a question that can be, it's a falsifiable question. It's a question that can be empirically answered. And, and that has something to say about how we see the world. Absolutely. Now, the, the, the best pushback I've gotten that from scientists, not, not the philosophical pushback, you know, that uh, this is, has to be self-refuting, you couldn't possibly get this from revolution. So I, I think I've answered that kind of philosophical pushback. From the scientists, the the pushback that, you know, that, you know, I've gotten, I get lots of cranks, but but for the real real scientists that really have some ideas, the, the, the cleanest idea I've seen from them is something along the line of, um, well, what if you have, um, tens of thousands of fitness payoff functions and, and they're coming at you fast and furious. You, you, you couldn't, you wouldn't have time to be tuned to any one fitness payoff function. And, and so maybe in that case, you might be tuned to the truth. And there've been some, some simulations and so forth to try to, to show that that's, that's the case. It's, it's interesting first to notice that um, the, the, the move here is, is, not, not to say, well, no, most fitness payoffs are going to shape you to see the truth. Um, they're sort of conceding that they might not. So what they're doing then is trying to make the fitness payoffs almost irrelevant. 
which is almost against the entire spirit of evolution. And the whole point of evolutionary theory is there are these fitness paths that guide evolution. So, and so their, their, their gambit is, well, let's, let's throw so many fitness paths at you that they couldn't possibly guide your evolution. So maybe your sensory systems won't be shaped by fitness payoff functions. So, but, so it, it's an odd gambit because it sort of cuts against the whole spirit of, of evolutionary theory. But, but, but that aside, it, it, it still misses a it, it's also challenging the the best math, the best tools that we have to model this, right? I mean, game theory, genetic algorithms, uh, perceptual strategies just are the cutting edge that we we would use to answer this. Right now, now, now these the, these scientists that that propose this um, understand what you said. They they would agree with you on that. But but what they were trying to do was to sort of um, make the fitness payoffs be irrelevant almost to your to your evolution because there were so many of them that you couldn't be tuned to any one of them and, and that way they could get around my, my argument and um so so i know th these are smart people and, and so what you said was absolutely true and, and and they understood that um but but here's here's the point that that um we plan to publish in, in response we've we've got a paper um in reply and, and that that is it's true that we face tens of thousands of fitness payoff functions and what do we do with them we create data structures that we call physical objects so when i see an apple um that's a data structure that encodes all sorts of po potential payoffs for certain actions i might take if i'm interested in mating well, the payoff from an apple is very, very low. I mean, trying to mate with an apple is not is not going to work. If I'm interested in eating, and I don't have an allergy to an apple, then that could be very, very good. If I'm interested in fighting, moderate. I might be able to throw it like yeah, as a weapon and throw someone hit someone in the head, but it's not a very good weapon. And you know, um, so for for any object, you know, so now if I have a sword, right? So now a, a knife is well, it's not very good for eating. Not very good for mating. It's good for fighting. Um, so, so what, what we do is we have all these different fitness payoffs, and we we take them and we do um, hierarchical clustering. We take all these weird fitness payoff functions, which could have all sorts of shapes. We cluster them hierarchically, cluster them into useful units, and we call those units objects. And so every time I look around, I now I see uh, you know a car. Now I see an apple. Now I see a person. Now I see a shoe. Every time I look, I'm seeing a new cluster of fitness payoffs, perhaps hundreds of fitness payoffs, all wrapped around what I call an object, and it's guiding. My... So, so yes, we do see thousands of fitness payoffs, and they're changing all the time. So these, so these are, are they're they're absolutely right. These arguments are absolutely. We have thousands of them. So what do we do with them? We don't ignore them. We don't just ignore them. We use them to create these these data structures that we call physical objects. So physical objects aren't the truth. They're useful data structures to handle exactly the problem that um, these people are, are, are raising, these researchers are raising. Right. Okay, so, so, so this view of looking at perception, uh, shifting, having that shift from looking at perception as this uh, window or camera snapshot, as you, as you like to say, to a constructive theory, um, has this been... Do you think this is more and more mainstream now? Do you think this is more and more accepted now, or there are still challenges to this? Uh, well, I, I would say this: uh, no one has just proven the theorem. Theorem. So we have a theorem that's published, and we have simulations. And the the only counters so far are some simulations of the kind I just said, where where people say they say throw thousands of fitness payoffs, and, and in that case, uh, effectively you ignore the fitness payoffs and you you're to the truth. Um, so that's why we do have to publish a paper where we say, well, but that's not, I mean, that's not the only strategy that you would have in evolution from, for having thousands of fitness payoffs is to effectively ignore them. Why don't you use them? I mean, that's what evolution theory is about is using your fitness payoffs. Why don't you use them to create data structures that we call objects and um, deal with this problem that way? So um, that's the strongest pushback that we have. Uh, no one has pushed back on the fitness payoffs almost surely don't have the information about the structure of the world. That's that's pretty devastating. And, and again, I should say, my own attitude is, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not doctrinaire about this. If someone can come up with um, a theory uh, of evolution that's different, 
where um, there's a bias on the fitness payoff such that they are biased somehow to have structure, certain structures in the world. Bring it on, I'd love, I'd love to see it. But my attitude is also that the physicists independently have decided that space-time is doomed, that, that space-time is not fundamental, which is stunning because physics until recently has been about what happens in space-time. <laughs> that's, that's what physics was. So some physicists have actually said, so it's not really clear what physics is about now, but, but it's pretty exciting. I mean, they're not, they're not scared or worried about it. They're, the, the younger generation is boldly going beyond space-time and finding structures like the amplitude-hedron and decorated permutations and so forth. So they're, they're, you know, space time is doomed. Thank you very much space time for everything that you gave us. Um, and now it's time to move on and find new structures, which of course have to project down to space time. So, so we're not throwing space time away. We need to do our tests where we can, which is in the space time data structure. You know, that's where we can get our empirical data is in, in space time. But the physicists themselves are saying space time isn't fundamental. So. When, when you get evolutionary theory saying our perception of space, time and objects is not is not veridical. Um, it's just a, it's just a headset. It's just a user interface that guides adaptive behavior. And then the physicists say, you know what, uh, we, we took Einstein's theory of space time that assumes space time is fundamental. And that theory itself says space time isn't fundamental. So when the two big pillars of modern science, evolutionary theory and, and quantum field theory and special and general relativity, are agreeing that space time isn't fundamental, uh, maybe it's time for us to move on. Um, maybe it's time for us to look for for structures beyond space time. Um, and so and, and that then, of course, has huge implications for theories of consciousness, because basically 99% of theories of consciousness that are on offer today, um, just assume as a matter of course, that space and time are fundamental and objects in space and time are fun, even the so called functionalist theories, which in principle, don't require any particular physical instantiation. If you actually, you know, for for example, integrated information theory, um, you could think of it as a functionalist theory. It doesn't require space time. But if you actually ask the, the, the people who are using it where they think is actually being instantiated, it's it's in space time. It's in it's you know neurons or or circuits or or what any physical system that has the right integrated information. They're not looking for instantiation outside of space time. They're not looking for ectoplasm or angels or anything like that to to instantiate the integrated information. So if so, if functionalists have some instantiation beyond space uh, beyond or outside of space time that they're thinking of, they haven't let on. So so I would say that functionalist physicalists and even and panpsychists uh, approach to um, consciousness all have this problem. Do you see that to be the case with all the consciousness theories? So. Um, IIT global basically workspace theories. Basically, ninety-nine percent of them. It's, it's um, I would say, ninety-nine percent of the theories out there. Even even the dualist theories, you know, are, are are assuming that space and time is fundamental, but then also something else in addition to space and time is fundamental. So they get that part wrong. So if you if you get the physics wrong, if, if the physicists are telling telling you space time isn't fundamental, and then the cognitive neuroscientists and so forth come along and say, well, we're going to take space time as fundamental in our theories of consciousness. Well, good luck. Yeah, I mean, the experts have told you don't do it, and here you are doing it. I mean, you're ignore. In some sense, that's not good naturalism in science. If you ignore the experts in in that, you know, in physics, and you say we're going to do it anyway, that, that does that's not naturalistic. That's that's recidivistic. So I, I'm I'm a naturalist. Let's let's take our best science. The physicists say it's over for space time, so it's over for space time. Great. So neurons don't create consciousness. Physical systems like like um, you know. Artificial intelligence circuits um, or software. Don't, I mean, anything inside space time is not fundamental, so it can't be the foundation for consciousness. Great. I mean, that's the glory of science is to take our deepest assumptions, smash them to pieces, and say, look somewhere else, look further, look deeper. And so that's what we need to do. Right. So just to linger on this for a second for, for the audience, uh, oftentimes when people talk about space-time not being fundamental. Uh, people kind of chalk that off to not being as important as it is here uh, in saying that, well, space-time is emerging out of some deeper structure. It might be anything, but it's still physical enough in that uh, it all connects. But that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is is more fundamental than that. It's that space-time is, is part of this construction that we have. And until unless we deal with that, 
we, we won't be ready to address what's real underneath. That, that's right. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and my attitude is um, cognitive neuroscientists like me who are studying consciousness should listen to the physicists when they tell us that, that um, space-time has no operational meaning at beyond 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. There, there, there's, there's nothing to rescue it. There, and, and they're finding these new structures like um, positive Grassmannians, amphitohedra, and, and the deepest is like a, something called a decorated permutation. And they're saying there are these structures that are beyond space-time, they're beyond quantum theory. So it's not like, like you know, forget space-time, but well, let's stick with quantum theory, you know, and build up space time from quantum theory. No, they're, they're saying there are no Hilbert spaces out here. We, we found structures beyond Hilbert spaces, beyond quantum theory, like the amplitudehedron. And the, the volumes of the amplitudehedron actually code for what are called scattering amplitudes, like the probability that two gluons hit each other and four gluons go spraying out and so forth, that colliders, like the LHC. So the, the volumes of these new structures uh, code for the scattering amplitudes. The the geometry of them, their, their facet structure, um, codes for properties of space-time like locality and unitarity and so forth. So you, you find these structures beyond space-time that, that, that project down to space-time. So space-time, so these structures are really complicated, high dimensional structures. Sometimes they're polytope, the amplitudehedron is not a polytope, but, it's, um, um, but, the, the, nor, but, but still there are these high dimensional st structures they project down to this little four four dimensional space time, you know, three dimensional space, one dimension of time. Um, so, the, or or even string theory is not. Deep. I mean, it's ten dimensions. Th these structures go many many more dimensions th than that. So there's, so it's a new game in town, and it's only by the way, it's less than ten years old. So you know, my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience can be forgiven, if you know the amplitudehedron's only been out for nine years. Well, so, okay, so they can be forgiven for not having jumped on board for the latest hype, you know, many physicists aren't even aware of this stuff. So, you know, why should I be ragging on them for, but, but, but ultimately, you know, my colleagues and who are studying consciousness and they're, you know, they're, these are my friends, they're, they're brilliant. But if you have the wrong foundation, doesn't matter how brilliant you are, you, you, you can't solve the problem. So I'm, I'm hoping that my, my, my brilliant friends and colleagues will really pay attention to what the physicists are telling us and and let go of, of this reductionist point of view which the like Nima Arkani Hamed at the Institute for Advanced Study is very very clear reductionism is dead the, the idea that as you go to smaller and smaller scales in space you find more and more fundamental laws and more and more fundamental entities governed by those laws that reductionist view um, has been a wonderful guide for quite a few decades maybe a couple few centuries but we now have a principled understanding that 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 is over. Reductionism fails. You know, we we know that it can't go beyond ten to the minus thirty three centimeters, and it actually fails well before that. So, so, so we have to, you know, you know. My colleagues are brilliant, and I would like their brilliance to actually have a chance to solve this problem. So we have to let go of space time, uh, because that's what the physicists are telling us to do. And so that's what that's what I'm doing with my my uh, collaborators where we let go of space time we have a theory of consciousness outside of space time and we're using decorated permutations that the physicists say um, are the deepest structure they found as our connection to build up space time right and just to be clear like uh reductionism may still be helpful in some some situations um so long as you have a well-defined problem i know you make the distinction between taking reality seriously versus taking it literally um in that a reduction appro reductionist approach lets you deal with a, a train that's coming at you, but it's not going to give you truths about the universe. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, reductionism, um, for example, reducing temperature to mean molecular kinetic energy in statistical thermodynamics. Wonderful. And, and there's no reason for us to, I mean, when we let go of space time and so forth, we're, we're, we're still going to want to, you know, that's a beautiful result, and we'll want to show it as a special case of a much deeper theory, and we'll want to understand why the appearance of reductionism worked in that particular case, but why, in some sense, it was lucky that it worked, and when we get to a deeper framework, we'll, we'll understand why reductionism is, in general, not uh, 
Correct, because space time itself is just a data structure. It's not the fundamental nature of reality, and it has you know a limited scope. It's by the way, it's a very shallow data structure, ten to the minus thirty three centimeters. If it was ten to the minus thirty three trillion centimeters, I'd be impressed. Ten to the minus thirty three, pretty shallow. I'm not impressed at all. So, so it's and yet it's had it's got a real grip on our imagination. So, is this um, is is this devastating for you, like personally, existentially, aside from scholarly occupations? Um, is this is this troubling? Very much so. Um, for reasons in part that um, the uh, child psychologist Piaget pointed out. Uh, that, that he, he thought that um, Piaget argued that when we're about, I don't know, 17, 18 months of age, we get what he calls object permanence. The, the, we're, we're programmed to have the belief that what we see is really there, independent of whether we see it or not. I, I see a, a, a baby doll. Um, Mom then puts the doll behind a pillow. Um, I believe that the doll still exists and there really is a doll behind the pillow and I, and I go look for it. Uh, Piaget thought that that happened 18 months. Later research suggests that it's, we're required to do it at three or four months. So, so our belief that physical objects exist, even if we don't perceive them, is, is not something that um, we believe because we rationally came to that conclusion. We, we believe it because we're programmed to believe it. And it's the way we see the world. And so when something that you've believed since before you can remember turns out to be false, that has that that's really it's unsettling and so it's been very unsettling for me uh, as it is for sometimes when i give talks and people hear me saying that evolution said we don't see the truth and they got that's nonsense and they they throw out a couple of obvious you know, ways that i must be wrong and self-contradicting and when i answer them after, after i've answered like four or five of them then i start seeing like fear and panic in the eyes of the audience, it's sort of like, we might have to take this idea seriously. And, and if you start to take the idea seriously, uh, it's, it's, it, it's not like a, a minor thing, like, you know, the speed of light is not 186,000 miles per second, it's 186 point, you know, it's, it's not some little minor thing like that. This is more like my, my whole world view has to change to accommodate this. And that's, that's deeply unsettling. So it, I've had to spend, um, actually, even to do this research, I have to spend a lot of time, like just quiet, <laughs> to even think this way because it's it, it's we're not programmed to, you know, at least I'm not programmed to think this way. It, it it's it's very very unsettling. So I, when when people have a hard time with it, hey, I, I'm I'm right there with it. Um, if it weren't if the math weren't there forcing this conclusion, I'm not sure I would have gone there myself. Right and. I think it's, I mean, it's even worse for you because you don't have to just live with it. You have to integrate into your intuitions in actively doing your work. It's not just a try to try to accept it and deal with it. That's right. And so, and I, I, I must say, so I talked about the downside just now that it's been, it's been a shock to the system. On the other hand, I do find it uh, exhilarating because it's sort of like, okay, once you get over the shock, uh, you know, and you learn that you it is possible to imagine things outside of space time, right? So a, lot, a lot of times when I start talking about this to my, my colleagues, they have a hard time even knowing what I'm talking about to talk about structures behind space time. So do you mean it's like some smaller structure inside space time? They're really tiny. What, what do you what, what could you possibly mean? It's outside space time. So it's it, so you have to really wrap your head around the idea that space and time is just a data structure. And we, we don't have to think of ourselves as confined to that structure. And it's the final reality. We're, we're free. We have the intellectual capacity to think entirely outside of space and time and, and look for structures beyond space and time and project them down to space and time. So w once you get over that and you realize it is possible to do it, it's exhilarating because it's sort of like it's, wow, it, it opens up a whole universe of possibilities. And then all of a sudden, in retrospect, now space time looks like this real simple straitjacket. I, I used to think of this vast everything. And now I think of it, as I said before, it's, it's, it's actually a somewhat shallow, limiting data structure. 
and and we don't have to have our our conceptions limited to it. We can go beyond it, uh, and that's, so I find it very freeing. So it's 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 disconcerting because um, um, one of the concrete implications of this is if you know objects are just data structures that we create that that and they only exist as we create them right it's like a virtual reality headset when i look at you know i'm playing a game when i look over and see you know another player or i look see a car or something in the virtual reality well i render it when i look and when i look away it's gone it, there there is no car in the in the supercomputer that's running the system for in that metaphor so so the idea that you know things are created and destroyed on the fly, and that's what what objects are. They're they're little data structures that we create. That means that that's true of my body and my brain. I don't have a brain right now. I don't have neurons. Neurons only exist when you render them on the fly. Now there is something that exists, but it's nothing inside space and time. I mean, our, our physics is very very clear. Space and time is not fundamental and it's clear from evolutionary theory so these are space time is a data structure that means we're rendering neurons when we need them and so so i don't have any neurons right now if you looked in my head you'd find neurons but that means that neurons are causing none of my behaviors so none of my behavior is caused by neurobiology now my attitude is of course i think we need more money for neurobiology and neuroscience because this, it, this means that neuroscience is much, much harder than we ever thought. We thought you look in the brain, you see neurons that are neurons. No, no, no. You look in the brain, you see a data structure that's pointing you to a much, much more complicated world. Neurons are just the shell. The behind the shell is this incredibly complicated world that we have to unpack. So we need, so, so neuroscience is really going to need a lot more funding because we, we you know, it, it's not as easy as we thought. And we didn't think it was easy. So. So, so it's really stunning at, at, at a lot of levels. Um, so yeah, it's been, it, it's emotionally quite a roller coaster. I, I spend time meditating to deal with the personal side, like, you know, okay, I'm not this body. So you know, what am I, you know, how, how do I, you know, recon reconceptualize myself or can I reconceptualize myself uh, if I'm not just this little thing in, inside a body, inside of space time. So, so it really, once you go down this rabbit hole, if you're going to be consistent, if you're, if you, you know, as a scientist, um, I want mathematical consistency. I don't, I'm not saying that my mathematical theories are the final word. No. So I'm not saying I have the final truth, but, but I'm not going to be inconsistent. I'm absolutely, I'm, I have no interest in being inconsistent. And so um, it's now inconsistent with our best science to think that I have neurons or to think that neurons cause my conscious experiences or my behavior. That's just inconsistent. Neurons are a data structure that's pointing to some other deeper realm beyond space time. The best the physicists have found are decorated permutations and amplituhedra, which are just these, these geometric entities or permutational ent entities just sitting there. There's no notion of dynamics right now. So we're at this really interesting stage where the physicists, it's like the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, where you see the the monolith and all the the apes are they see this monolith and they're beating on it and they don't know what they're just, they're just sitting there and 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 so we have these monoliths like the amplitudehedron and positive grossmannian and, and the de decorated permutations just sitting there beyond space time and the question is okay who put them there <laughs> who who called for that there, there's no notion of any process or dynamics going on there Yes, their, their structures code for the properties of space time and give you the scattering amplitudes, but why? And, and there's nothing moving out there. It's just, it's just almost like a platonic world in the sense that it's just these entities sitting there. So, so we're, we're definitely not done. The physicists have just really begun the, the move outside of space time. And, they, and of course, they would be the first to say that. They don't need Hoffman to tell them that. They would, they, <laughs> they're the ones who are saying that. So they, they're they understand that these are the first baby steps outside of space time and, and I, they certainly understand that there's nothing dynamical in what they've done so far and they i can imagine that they would like something dynamic although I don't, I don't hear them talking about it so okay so let me ask you the the cliche question um i can understand that that space time is doomed and that there are these deeper structures uh amplitude or whatever 
other complex topological structure we may find. Um, but but why do you go toward consciousness? Uh, why do you see the link between consciousness? Part, partly it's just poverty of my imagination. Um, so it's, um, you know, I have this, we all have the feeling that uh, we have experiences like headaches or smell of garlic, taste of chocolate, sound of a trumpet. Um, and we've, most of, uh, most of us who are, are scientists have thought, well, so we need to understand how, for example, a neural activity causes those, those experiences. And this, that's the framework in which, you know, I was, I was brought up, you know, and all of my colleagues are working in that, in that framework. So somehow we have to figure out the, the physical basis and per, perhaps the neural basis in the human case of, of our conscious experiences. Well, now space time is not fundamental. So, okay, so I'm not going to be booting up my conscious experiences from space time. And, and, and you know, I'm not going to be doing it from amplitude hedra. There's not enough, there's, there's not enough there yet. So my attitude is, and, and the other motivation is this. It's what I call the stipulation problem of conscious, consciousness. My, my, my friends and colleagues, and again, the, these, are, these are good friends and colleagues, so there's nothing personal here. They're, they're brilliant, and uh, they're, they're doing great work, and I hope they continue. Um, but their theories like the integrated information theory or global workspace theory or... Um, or trade collapse of quantum states of microtubules theories, they they stipulate that space and time are fundamental. Um, even IIT, it's a functionalist theory, but um, all of the instantiations are in space time. So so they stipulate that space time is fundamental. Uh, and if they have some other instantiation, I'd like to hear about it. Right. But but so they stipulate that. Then they stipulate uh, these functional properties, like the integrated information theory, the global workspace theory, or the orchestrated class. So they have to stipulate, in addition to the physics of space time and so forth, they stipulate these more functional things. And then um, they have to stipulate the conscious experiences. Because um, if you, I've asked Julia Tononi, um back in 19, late 1990s, and again, just a few couple of years ago, can you, um, is there any specific conscious experience that you can give me the pr particular pattern of integrated information that must be that conscious experience, like the taste of chocolate? What is the integrated information pattern that must be the taste of chocolate? It could not be the smell of garlic or whatever. Can, can you give me even one conscious, one, I mean, this is supposed to be a theory of conscious experiences. So what conscious, what specific conscious experience can you explain without hand wave? None. How about global workspace? None. Orchestrated collapse of microtubules, none. So every conscious experience is also stipulated. What the, so we have, say, we have some neural correlates, right? So area V4 of, of, of visual cortex is correlated with color experience. So, so if we're going to say, here's this pattern of integrated information in area V4, then you have to stipulate that that's the color red. I mean, you, because you, it's not a theorem from your theory. So you're stipulating space time and it's, and it's properties, you're stipulating your own functional properties like integrated information or, and then you're stipulating the conscious experiences. So my attitude was, um, uh, Occam's razor says stipulate as little as possible. Everybody's stipulating space time and their algorithms and conscious experiences. How about I just stipulate conscious experiences? I'll just start with conscious experiences. That means I have some hard work to do because I don't get to stipulate space time. They stipulate it. I don't have to, I, I, I don't have the pleasure of stipulating it. I have to derive it. So I have to show how space time would arise from a dynamical uh, uh, sequence of, you know, dynamics of conscious agent. And I can't stipulate integrated information. I have to show how, if, inf if integrated information is, turns out to be of value, I'll have to show from a dynamics of consciousness why, why you would get integrated information. So I can't, I can't just stipulate that. So, so the idea is to stipulate as little as possible. Um, and, you know, I said, I started off by saying it's the, the poverty of my imagination. Um, if, if space time isn't fundamental, in some sense, the only other thing around for me to think about is, is our conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. One, one could go deeper in say, um, awareness, pure awareness without any particular content. So one can go there. And that's as far as Hoffman has gone so far. Now, I'm not saying that that's the final road. That just shows you know, how shallow Hoffman's thinking is. 
But that, that's as far as I've gotten. And I would love to have someone say, yeah, well, behind conscious experiences and behind pure awareness without any experience that whatever, there is something, you know, being, you know, but, but, and we, or, or whatever it might be, um, that, that's even more fundamental. So I'm open to that. But um, my attitude is, you know, conscious experiences are a good next baby step. You know, if we let go of space time, we, you know, maybe conscious experiences won't be the final word, but it seems like it's an, a natural next step. And maybe if we do our work there, and get a mathematically precise theory, that theory will then tell us why we need to go beyond conscious experiences. Just like Einstein's theories and, and quantum theory told us why we had to go beyond, that we had to go beyond space-time, right? These theories that assume space-time then tell us the edge of it. So my attitude is, let's, let's do theories of consciousness because that seems like it's within our grasp, we can do it, and if we do it right, then our theory itself may help us to see the next step that we needed to take beyond conscious experiences. Right. And, and they might be helpful for solving the hard problem, right? Like that. I mean, all these theories are brilliant and, and I'm not smart enough to understand all of them, but um, they, they just don't solve the hard problem yet. I mean, even, even uh, orchestrated collapse, microtubules, which has important implications for quantum gravity, um, doesn't, doesn't definitively solve the hard problem. Well, it, yeah, in fact, it, it, it can't deal with any one specific conscious experience. There's, there's, it's, a, it's a theory of conscious experiences that can't explain even one conscious experience. I mean, if I, if I had a, a theory of physics that couldn't explain even one dynamical system of physics, I would say, well, I don't. I think that's not really a theory of physics. You call it a theory of physics, but if, if the, a theory of conscious experiences that can't explain one conscious experience. I don't know why it's called a theory of conscious experience. <laughs> uh, it, 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 so that's the, and again, these are my friends and colleagues and, and I mean, I'll, I'll be hard nosed at, at conferences that we'll go have a beer and, and be friendly and, and chat about this stuff afterwards. But, but when we're doing the science, I mean, you know, I have to put it to them and say, look, um, there's no beef here. There's no specific conscious experience that can be explained. And so, and, and that's, that's true for all these physical theories. And I think the physicists are telling us why. The physicists are saying, you'll never get it because space-time isn't fundamental. If you start with something inside space-time, you're starting with the wrong foundation. That's not what's fundamental. Right. And, and I mean, uh, moving on to your, to your conscious actor model, um, I think it's very interesting because A, it is falsifiable principally, and, and B, it's not a dualist theory. Yeah, the world is entailed within the model. Uh, it's, it's totally monist, totally naturalist theory. Exactly right. I, I, I agree with you on both points. It's, it's monist, so there's only conscious agents. It's conscious agents all the way down. And it's, um, it's not dualist. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, that this, there, so and it's not panpsychist. So like panpsychists will say space-time is fundamental and the particles that physicists have found, like the the, the bosons, leptons, and quarks. Um, those are the fundamental particles, and what's the fundamental nature of those particles, though, is not physical, it's consciousness. So, so it's a kind, they, they might not call it dualism, they'll, they'll say panpsychism, it's, um, but they're, they're shoehorning consciousness into a space-time structure. The physicists are telling us it's not fundamental, so we're shoehorning our theory of consciousness into a discarded physics model. Why would we want to sh jump into something that the physicists have discarded and not just discarded, but found something deeper like the amplitude heater. So, so, so panpsychism is using a discarded model and trying to shoehorn consciousness into the structure of a model that, that we now know is just, a, is actually a very poor data structure and a very shallow data structure. So that's not a, a promising way to go for a fundamental theory of consciousness. So, so it's not dualist, it's not panpsychist, it, it is monist, and it's, um, it's mathematically precise. And what we're doing right now, we, we, um, we're about to submit a paper for publication probably next month, or at the end of this month. What we've taken, what we've done is we've taken the theory of conscious agents and said, okay, the physicists have told us that the deepest structure they found beyond space-time 
are these things called decorated permutations. So if we want to boot up space-time from consciousness, we need to show how our theory gives rise to decorated permutations. Because if we can do that, the physicists show us how to go from decorated permutations to scattering amplitudes in space-time. So they've done a lot of heavy lifting for us, right? All we need to do, so they gave us a little interface. Here's the interface, decorated permutations. If we can get to take the theory of consciousness and get it to project into decorated permutations, then they say, okay, well, here's how you build an amplitude hedron from it, and the volume of the amplitude hedron gives you the scattering amplitude. So we can just you now study what the physicists have done um, and, and use that to, to go all the way to space time. So um, a few weeks ago, we did that. We, 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 our, our dynamics is Markovian. It's the Markovian dynamics of conscious agents. So at, at one point, I said, well, okay. They want decorated permutations. So surely someone has shown how to, to assign decorated permutations to Markov chains. So I went and looked and did a search. I couldn't find anything. Now, maybe someone else will find it, but I, I couldn't find anything. I, I, and I looked at the, at the, the, the best players. I, um, a brilliant mathematics professor, Lauren Williams at, at Harvard, she, who's been working, she knows decorated permutations and is working also in Markov chains. So I really looked at her work to see if she had actually done a mapping from the like arbitrary Markov kernel, Markov chain to de decorate. And, I, and I, I didn't see it. And I, you know, maybe she's done it and I didn't find it. But So we decided, okay, uh, we need some new math here, it looks like. You know, what is a mapping from Markov chains to decorated permutations? And that's in our paper. We, we discovered uh, it's a beautiful mapping. It's, it's completely clean. And we can actually show the relationship of our mapping to the mapping between positive Grassmannians and decorated permutations. So we can show, so we now, so that's what this paper is doing is saying we have a theory of consciousness, qua consciousness, not as emergent from space-time or neurons, it's, it's outside of space-time. Just the theory of Marconi dynamics, we have a canonical way of mapping that into decorated permutations, and therefore we get to use all the good work of the physicists to go from decorated permutations to the amplitude hedron into scattering amplitudes. So, so now I just have to read that literature and understand how, how their part of the story goes. So that's what I'm doing right now, but we've, we've got the map into decorated permutations. And, and so I'm pretty excited because maybe the physicists will be interested too. It seems like the physicists, you know, maybe they're, they couldn't care less about consciousness, who knows, but they might care about a dynamical system behind the amplitude hedron. That might be of interest to them. So they're, you know, there's just this static structure called the amplitude hedron is just sitting there, and there's decorated permutations behind it. But they might, and I would imagine some of them would be very interested in saying, well, you know, is there any dynamical interpretation that we could give that's even deeper than the amplitude hedron? Well, here's here's one offer. I'm not saying it's the only thing that we'll find, but here's here's an idea um, that's 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 pretty natural. Once, frankly, it, it, this this was um, this mapping to decorated permutations is is work that, that is collaborative between Chaitan Prakash uh, and, and I. And it, and it didn't take that long. It's, it's, once you think about it, it's not that hard. So, so it's pretty fun. Sometimes I think the problem is just sort of a conceptual thing where, where, where a lot of people, a lot of physicists don't think, don't think consciousness is what we're talking about here, right? Like people think of consciousness as this macroscopic property that can only be applicable at a certain level of complexity but that's not that's not what's meant here it's it's a it's a far deeper problem well you're you're absolutely right and that, that's a really important point um so just take integrated information theory for example right they they might you know I, I just made the point that they can't explain any specific conscious experience you know like taste of chocolate and so forth and and but they they, they can come back and say but look what we can do is we can use integrated information theory to tell whether a system is conscious or not. So we can't say what kind of consciousness they might have, but it's really a valuable contribution that we can that we can say that this system has the right kind of integrated information complexity to be conscious or, or, or not. And we might be able to use that to help patients that are in you know locked in syndrome and decide whether or not they're locked in syndrome or whether they're really gone, um, for example. Yeah. And decide whether you help to pull a plug, but I think that even there, they're they're not getting what they think. So their 
arguing that they, they're still thinking about consciousness as an emergent property. Once you get a, a non-conscious system that has the right complexity of functional organization or causal organization in their case, then consciousness somehow uh, emerges from that. Now, but space-time isn't fundamental. Objects in space-time and the complexity of objects in space-time are not fundamental. They're just a data structure. So, so right now, for example, we're, we're talking via Zoom. And uh, there, so there's pixels on the screen. And some pixels on the screen, so I, I see behind you, I see a desk, uh, a, a bookshelf with books and so forth. And they're not moving very much and so forth. Um, and so I could use my little algorithm, you know, Hoffman's integrated information theory of, of pixels and, and say, well, no, the, the books are probably not animate. But, the, but if I look at your face pixels, I mean, there, there's face, you know, the eyes are moving, the, you know, the face is moving, you're nodding and you're smiling and so forth. There's, there's, there's a, so I could come up with my own complexity measure and say, aha, these, and I might say, these pixels are conscious. The pixels for Ashar's face are conscious, but the book pixels are not. Well, pixels are pixels. And to say that pixels are conscious or not is, is, is just a mistake. It's a category error. Some pixels um, are providing a useful portal into your consciousness, right? The, I mean, the pixels that give me an, an image of your face and your face is, is giving me some um, access to, you know, if you think I'm full of it or if you like what I'm saying or whatever it might be. So, so I'm getting some access to your consciousness. So, so integrated information theory is essentially a, a theory of, of the pixels being conscious and the pixels aren't conscious. And, and, and that's really important because that means that in a medical situation, getting an, I, I, an integrated information score that says um, um, consciousness only means that we, it, it's showing that we have access to the consciousness. It's not showing that whether or not there is consciousness, right? That those are two very, very different things. It's whether the, the pixel dynamics is, is, is complex enough for me to, to understand Ashar's consciousness or not. But that, that's independent of whether Ashar is conscious or not. If, if the pixels aren't, aren't doing it, that doesn't mean Ashar isn't conscious. It just means the pixels aren't up to it. So, so it's, it's quite possible that we could pull the plug on someone because they didn't have the right integrated information theory. And they could be fully conscious because it's, we're not getting a measure of consciousness qua consciousness. We're getting a measure of how well our interface lets us get access to the consciousness that's already there. So, so that's why this is not just um, abstract stuff. This cuts into hospital settings and whether we want to pull the plug. If, 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 if I'm right, if this and integrated information theory is, is effectively just a theory of the pixels of a space time, you know, a, you know entities inside, inside space time, which is just a data structure, it's only measuring our access to the conscious, how much we can see of the conscious. It's not measuring the exact reality of the consciousness, only our access to it. That distinction makes all the difference in the world as to whether you want to use it in a medical setting to decide life and death. Uh, that that's such an important point. Um, that's such an important point. That, that, that there is this implicit assumption out there that, well, when you get to the lower levels, we can we're right to be confused because the dynamics aren't worked out, and there are these complex exotic mathematics that we don't know of. But when we scale high enough into complexity, we can be confident to use our methods and and make claims about medicine or psychology or economics. But that's not the case. Scaling doesn't reduce the doesn't get rid of the problem. That's right, and. As long as we understand that we're like with neuroscience that we're dealing with the user interface so that the, the neurons um, that we see are the neurons that we render when we look. And then we understand that there's a much more complicated reality behind the neurons or behind the bio, our biology. If we understand that we can use the neurons and I, I mean I, I've collaborated and, and worked on MRI, fMRI and uh, EEG studies. I'm all for neuroscience. I mean, I, I think we should, we need more work in neuro neuroscience and so forth, not less. Um, but we have to be very, very careful and, and, and realize that 
we, we can't just take those things at face value. We really have to go much, much more deeply on them. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, picking up on something you, you talked about earlier, um, one thing that's really puzzling is this, this transition between empty, what you call being, or empty consciousness, consciousness not realized, uh, to going to any kind of any kind of organization of consciousness. That's such a puzzling problem. Um, do you have thoughts as to how that happens? The, the way we're doing it is we, we have this mathematical model we call a conscious agent. And we can talk about very simple conscious agents that, you know, a conscious agent might only have one experience. Like this agent only sees red. That's all it, that's all it can experience. And another agent only experiences green and so forth. And then we can look at how they interact. And it's a theorem of our mathematics that when two agents interact or even just when you have two agents or n agents those n agents also are an agent but just follows from the mathematical definition of an agent they satisfy the definition so they are an agent that means if i say i start off with a countable set of agents so the countable set being like this the 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 infinity of the integers one two three up through infinity that that's that's the smallest infinity the but mathematicians call a left zero the smallest infinity so suppose we start off with a bunch of simple agents and we have a left zero infinity of them well our our theory says that any subset of those agents is also an agent so that means any we have to look at all possible subsets that's called the power set so you look at the collection of all subsets of a set that's called the power set well the power set of the infinity a left zero is a new infinity it's a higher infinity called a left one. So it's a much bigger infinity. And then all those agents take their power set, we get a left two, and then a left three. And so our theory makes a very, very clear prediction that um, there's one agent, because whenever you have any agents, they also are an agent. So in some sense, our theory says, yes, there is one agent, and only one agent, if you wish. On the other hand, it says, but you cannot describe that agent because to describe it, you would have to go all the way up Cantor's hierarchy. This is called Cantor's hierarchy of all these infinities. So, so we might, so we're supposed that, you know, in a hundred years, we're at a left 5 billion. Well, amazing. Well, we, we've, we've gone up 5 billion levels of infinity and we've studied all the possible combinations of conscious agents up to that level and understand their properties. Incredible time to break out the champagne, but, but, but our mathematics is there saying, um, great accomplishment. But you have to go to infinity. Cantor's hierarchy has infinite number of levels, so you'll never get there. So you want, some people might say, why don't you start with a theory of the one and then just show how all of our, our consciousnesses are projections of that one? And I wish I could, but we can't. It's, it's, it's mathematically impossible. You, you can't do it. And so, but that's just no surprise because as we talked about before, there is no scientific theory of everything. You know, there, there is no scientific theory that could explain everything. You, know, you can only explain everything except your, the assumptions of your theory. And a new theory that explains those assumptions will have its own assumptions, ad infinitum. So, so the nice thing, I, I, what I like about scientific theories, a good scientific theory is mathematically explicit and says explicitly what the limits of that theory are. In our case, the theory will say, you got to ALF 5 trillion, congratulations, you only have an infinite number of hierarchies left in Cantor's hierarchy to go. It tells you exactly its limit, what you've uh, the limits of what you've done so far. And that's what you really want is for a theory to tell you its limit. That's a good cure for dogmatism. And, and, and your theory also doesn't posit anything about selfhood, right? Selfhood or identity or uh, memory or all the other sort of elementary cognitive properties that people put into the downscale version of these things. That's a good point. So our, also in the spirit of Occam's razor, where you want to have as few assumptions as possible, essentially our only assumptions are that there are conscious experiences and that they probabilistically influence the probability of other conscious experiences happening. That's it. So there is, as you said, no notion of self, learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, um, and so forth, but um, it's trivial with our Markovian dynamics of conscious agents, where the Markovian dynamics is how conscious experiences probabilistically affect 
the occurrence of other probabilistic experiences. So it's a Markovian dynamics. So with that dynamics, it's trivial to show that it's computationally universal. So anything you can do with neural networks, you can do with networks of conscious agents. So we can build, so even though it's only started off with very simple assumptions of experiences, of influencing experiences, if you want, you can build up a theory of self or learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, all that stuff, you can do that. But it's not limited to computation. The measurable sets on which the Markovian kernels are defined need not be computable sets. And so, <clears throat> so we're not limited to computation. So it, 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 it's, so, so, so yeah, I think that you want your theory to force you to do all that work. If I had a theory of consciousness that said, well, and so I'm assuming not only experiences and probabilistic influences, but also a self and learning and memory and problem solving, and, and all these things are, are part of my assumptions. Well, then I've got my own stipulation. I mean, I, I just made a big deal about the stipulation problem of consciousness for, my, for all my brilliant colleagues, right? There's, they're stipulating space time, they're stipulating IIT, then they have to stipulate the conscious experiences that are associated with it. They're stipulating everything. Well, I don't want to stipulate everything. I, I, want, so I But you have to stipulate something. So you have to stipulate the absolute minimum. And so we're trying to be absolute minimum conscious experiences and probabilistic influences among them, and then boot up everything. And then once we boot up consciousness, project it down to decorated permutations and show how space-time is just a, a user interface that some conscious agents um, employ to interact with other conscious agents. But it's, it's one of, of countless interfaces. This is not anything special. It's, there are countless interfaces you could use. Space-time just happens to be one. So it's not the final reality. It's just one kind of headset for a particular kind of game. That's all. Right. So, sorry, this is going a bit into left field here, but uh, th then does do you imagine that cognition or the mixed bag of cognitive properties just kind of emerge somewhere? Or or do you see these cognitive properties also being uh, somehow deeply related to these, these structures? So, um, when I teach a big class in intro, the site, I'll often say, a standard thing um, in, in cognitive neuroscience that um, you know 90 plus percent of our mental processes are unconscious. Right? So you have billions of neurons and lots of stuff going on, a lot of mental processes, but most of it's unconscious. And so I, 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 I've said that many times in my classes, um, but strictly speaking, it's not true, right? It may not be conscious to me, I might, I might be aware, but, but right now, for example, um, I'm not directly aware of Ashar's conscious experiences. They're, they're, I'm, not, I'm not conscious of them. D does that mean that Ashar is not conscious? No, it, it means that I don't have access. The consciousness is there. I don't have access to it. So the, the cognitive processes that you're talking about that most of that the, I and my colleagues call unconscious processes, they're not strictly speaking unconscious processes they're just not conscious to me but that doesn't mean that they're unconscious simpliciter and in a theory in which i say assume that consciousness is fundamental and conscious agency is a model of it so that's my fundamental reality then um consciousness is fundamental um and if i if so my space-time headset that i'm using right now it gives me insight into your consciousness through your face with my cat, I get good insight, some insight from, through my cat icon. An ant icon gives me less insight. You know, an amoeba icon gives me almost none. And a rock icon is giving me no insight into the consciousness behind. By hypothesis, I'm always interacting with consciousness. Not consciousness is in space-time, right? There's not a consciousness in the rock. There's not a consciousness in my body. These are, consciousness is entirely outside of space-time. It's not in my brain. It's not in my body. It's not in your body. These are just merely headset symbols. So it's entirely outside of space-time. So the, the distinction we make between living and non-living things in space-time or conscious and non-conscious things, that's, it's not principle. Those distinctions, there is no principle distinction between living and non-living. It's an artifact of the limitations of our user interface. A user interface has to give up. That's what it's for. It's, it's there to simplify things. So at some point, it doesn't reveal the consciousness to you anymore, right? Uh, with Ashkar's giving me, Ashkar's base is giving me some, with Cad's giving me some, 
with a rock has given me none. Well, that's what an interface does. It gives up. So I'm not saying a rock is conscious. Nothing inside space-time is conscious. Nothing. Space-time itself is just a headset. Right. I mean, just, just even by asking that question about the emergence of cognition, I've already snuck in stuff about space-time that isn't principally founded yet and already already messed up the question. That's why your question was great. I mean, it forces out this really important distinction. I mean, that's a, so it's a great question. Okay. Um, a bit of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, you mentioned meditation earlier. Uh, have you? What are your thoughts about the spiritual contemplative traditions, and have they aided in the search at all? So there's, you know, the, I'm saying that space time isn't fundamental, and that, that right now I'm thinking about a scientific theory in which consciousness is fundamental, and there are many um, spiritual traditions that will say, well, you're you're late to the party. We've been saying this kind of thing for thousands of years. Uh, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism. Uh, mystical Christianity, uh, mystical Islam, mystical Judaism. I mean, there, there, and probably many others that I don't know about. Um, so there's the mystical traditions in in all these various um, directions um, have been saying similar things, and so I think that my attitude is I want to listen to what they have to say uh, in the same way that I listen to my colleagues in the sciences, which is with. Um, respect and healthy skepticism, <laughs> right? Both. That's just so. So I, I I think that they they have some really important insights that I I want to to learn from, and I suspect just like in science, um, we make mistakes. I'm I expect that some of their ideas in some of in certain ways of putting them things are are not helpful. Um, and they may be misguided. So, so I want to learn from them, um, and I and then I, I think what ultimately I want is a like an interaction between science and spirituality. I think that they have two pieces of the puzzle, and a, a, a collaboration could be useful because scientists have developed the tools of mathematical precision in theories and precise experimental tests of those theories. And that is a that really is important because two things: your theories are smarter than you. In science, when Einstein wrote down his field equations for general relativity, he didn't know about black holes. He didn't believe in black holes. His equations taught him that there are black holes. Now, when you just do things in English or whatever your language is. It's very rare sometimes, but, but it's, it's very rare that you're going to get that kind of tutoring from what you wrote down. I mean, again, think about what, what tutoring that Einstein got. Black holes, that's pretty specific learning that you're getting from your theory. I mean, Einstein started off with people in falling elevators and standing on weights. and the mathematics comes back and says, by the way, your, your thought experiments mean that there are black holes. Holy smoke. I mean, so, so you, when you do these mathematically precise theories, you get this incredible payoff that you become the student of your theory and the theory takes you places that, that your, your own ideas need to go, but you didn't know it. But the second, the, the, the scientific theories also tell you the limits. They say, um, this theory is good up to this point, and then it fails. And that's what we don't, so we don't have those two things in the spiritual traditions. We don't have the precision that will come back and slap you in the face and say, here's you know, the, where your own theory tutors you. And we don't have this antidote to dogmatism. I mean, scientists are people, so scientists are just as dogmatic as anybody. But when your theories come back, and, and someone else, maybe I, I, I won't use my own theory to show I'm wrong, but my, my friend will. My, my, my scientific colleagues will be happy to use my theories to show me the limits of my ideas. So that's the antidote to dogmatism. You know? and, and so what, I, I would love that in the spiritual traditions as well. So the, the spiritual traditions could, I mean, they talk about having what they say be thought of as pointers, not the truth. The, the Tao, Tao Te Ching starts off by saying the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Absolutely right. 
but then you have to go on to speak, you know, and then the rest of the book carries on after that. So, so, so you have pointers and, and, but now you know that the pointers all have limits. Well, okay. What are the limits of this pointer? What, what, how far should I take it seriously? And, and when should I let go? And, and you don't get that with just language. Typically you do get that with, with mathematical precision. So the math, the mathematical precision would be very, very helpful, but, but second, Often spirituality, as we have seen many times, degenerates into religiosity. And people will kill each other because your pointers are different from mine. I think Jesus is the way and you say Buddha is the way. And so we're going to fight and kill and, and, and so forth. And so, so having clear pointers that can teach you, but then also having pointers that show you their own limits so that the dogmatism doesn't come up and, and we don't end up killing each other because I believe this pointer and you don't believe this pointer. Well, if the pointer itself said, don't believe me beyond this point, then we wouldn't have to fight over it because the pointer itself would, would be saying, don't do this, don't do this. Uh, this pointer only goes this far. So that's, I think that would be a, a wonderful way to, to stop the fights and, and, uh, and, have a, a more profitable collaboration. So, so I see science and spirituality um, really being able to, to help each other. But of course, there's a bad history since Galileo, for at least, you know, the church, the, the Catholic church at the time put him under house arrest, threatened him with physical harm um, because he disbelieved things that um, the church believed that have turned out to be patently false. Well, the church believed things that were patently false. So, so as a result, scientists have said, if that's what religion is, then we, no, thank you. Um, and so we need to now move beyond and, and, and you know, go to the place where we can have a, a profitable dialogue. Um, and it's going to require both sides to um, make compromises in, in the sense that, you know, on the religious side, there may be pointers that, that you're deeply attached to that, that may turn out to be extremely shallow pointers. They're, they're not that deep and you really need some deeper pointers. And on the science side, well, you know, for, for scientists, letting go of space time, hey, that, that, that's a new trick. It's not a very comfortable trick. And, and uh, most scientists, most of my colleagues in neuroscience are not happy with it. So, so there's something on the, the scientists to have some, some big adjustments as well. So, but, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sanguine. I think that, um, my generation probably won't get it, but the younger generation will start to get it. I mean, my generation just has to die, but the new generation will will um, will will begin to forge these new links um, between the the good parts of science and the good parts of spirituality, um, and and I think it'll be for the benefit of all humanity. Right, I, absolutely. I mean, I, the political problems I don't think are trivial. Like I, I, they, they seem very right. difficult to overcome. Um, yeah, just historical contingencies, bad blood. Um, yeah, and I mean, I mean, some somehow some there's somewhat a principal reason for them as well, right? Like, I think at least in my recent and very very limited practice of spiritual uh, spiritual practices, the, the, there really is a, a personal emphasis on it. Like, I can gain a lot of it. I can gain a lot from just personally sitting and reflecting every day, or just meditating in silence. Yes. But I have no idea. How to scale that to a social relationship or a political citizenship or my role as an economic actor i have no idea how to how to link those things together and in some senses if you're forming movements those questions are important they they need to be dealt with yeah so no i i agree i, I think that of course it starts with the individual as you as you are doing and and uh in some sense unless you yourself are um, centered, unless you are um, in some sense of let go of ego and and let go of identification with your physical form and, and your status in the world and your need to compete and be important and, and, and to the extent that, that, that and to, you have to be right and everybody else has to be wrong to the well, it's only to the extent that i have begun to let go of that that i can be a positive influence um 
otherwise everything I do to organizationally to try to get people to, can we all get along? If I haven't let go of my own ego, then I'm tainted at the source and everything I do will be tainted all, all the way through. So, so there's, 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 I think no substitute for individuals letting go and doing what you're, what you're talking about, which is meditating and, and letting go of the egoic need to be right and you wrong and, and, um, all, all, all the stuff that leads to um, the, the wonderful theory of, of evolutionary psychology, right? Evolutionary psychology wonderfully documents all of our problems here, <laughs> and, 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 you know, all the strategies that we use to, you know, one-up each other and, and, and so forth. So evolutionary psychology is the correct scientific theory of the false self, as the spiritual traditions call it. That it is, but I think the spiritual traditions are right that there is, um, the false self is just an illusion that we've bought into. And as we let go of the illusion, um, then we can be guides or helps or whatever to, to others to let go of the illusion. Um, and I, I think ultimately that that's one of the things I'm hoping for in this, this rapprochement between science and spirituality is that, um, it will facilitate this, that it will become scientifically clear that the false self is a false self. It will become clear that, yeah, evolutionary psychology correctly describes how we will behave and feel when we're identified with the false self. But there is a deeper psychology that transcends that. And and that is, as human beings and as scientists, it is in our best interest to go there. For example, for me as a scientist, all of my scientific theories, all scientific theories are conceptual, right? We write down mathematics, we write down words, they're all conceptual. But we know from Gödel's incompleteness theorem that any formal theory leaves out countless truths. You, know, you, you, you girl proved you, know, you, you have this really fancy mathematical theory he can always show you a, a statement that's true but can't be proven within your theory and if you add that statement to your theory then he'll show you a new statement that's true and can't be proven and so there's that's pointing to an unbounded intelligence beyond any conceptual intelligence that we have beside beyond any concept and that's us. That I mean, this, I think the spiritual traditions are right in this. The mathematical work that I'm doing on consciousness seems to point in that direction. That that there is this one consciousness. We're not divorced from it. You and I are it, and we are projections of that one consciousness. And so, in meditation, when you actually go into silence and you let go, really let go of your conceptions, you are actually opening up to this infinite intelligence. That's really you. And that infinite intelligence has all the possibility for opening up new fields of science, as well as new fields of cooperation, politically, emotionally, spiritually. So as we learn from science itself, and like Gödel's incompleteness theorem, that stepping out of our theories. And stepping into utter silence is actually not stupid. It's actually what our best science suggests is the right way to proceed. If we want to have the deepest ideas and the, and the deepest contact with other people who are just the same as me, the one consciousness under a different avatar. So, so in other words, as science and spirituality really integrate. Spirituality will lose many of the wrong bells and whistles that it has, but the deep insights will still be there and science will grab onto those. And, and I think it will lead us to realize that, yes, we need, when we're doing linguistic or conceptual things, we want absolute precision. No messing around. We want falsifiable theories, no BS. But then if you want deep intelligence, let go of all of your theories. 
go into absolute silence. And that's also where you'll, you'll get in deepest touch on a human level with other people and see them for who they are, which is just the one consciousness under a different guise. And so, so I see this rapprochement as, as, as a healing, like you mentioned politics, where, where our, our politics is, is, is polarized right now in many, many places in the world. And, and again, in many cases, because my pointers are different from yours and you don't believe my, my religious pointers and so forth. So, so the stuff we're talking about is not just theoretical, it's, it's, it, has, it cuts on our politics today. So I see a rapprochement and, and a real moving forward where we will learn to, you know, as, as Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, because your neighbor is yourself. And, and, you, and you really see that not just as some platitude that some guy said 2000 years ago, you see it as um, the, a deepest insight that's compatible with our best science. There is just the one consciousness and, and to love your neighbor as yourself is really to love yourself. And when you do that, when you really take that to heart, then you're much less likely to, you know, be ragging on your neighbor because of differences in politics or killing your neighbor because of differences in religion. <clears throat> so, do, do you think that in some sense this process will have to be conscious, like that we, we consciously have to bridge that gap? Because, I mean, we can understand why you'd go the other way, right? Evolutionary dynamics, market dynamics, political theory tell us that if you just if you do science with cutthroat, brutal competition and just let just let competition take over, you'll probably produce a whole lot of data and a whole lot of success. But yeah, so is, is it you, you really have to go out of your way and it's a great act of labor to step outside of that? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, but, uh, just on the evolutionary psychology stuff, <clears throat> I, I agree with what you said there too. Communism sounds great from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Wonderful. It doesn't work. It, it, and, and capitalism does work, which is nature red and tooth and claw. We're competing, fighting, and, and, and so forth. Well, so capitalism works because we're all tied to our false self. If we let go of ourselves, then, then communism would work. But, but the communism doesn't work, not because it shouldn't work, but I mean, it should work, but, but we're, we're all tied to our false selves. And so we're all competing. Um, so, so, but you're, you're right that this is a, requires a conscious step. It's really consciousness waking up, right? We're, we're asleep in and a dream in which I dream that I am this body. I dream that I am just my neurons. I'm nothing but neural activity. All my conscious experience are, I, we're, we're dreaming all this stuff. And, and then I'm constantly in my thoughts and, and fighting with people mentally or, 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 or verbally or whatever, because the, the ego is always competing and so forth. And I'm competing with our scientists, competing with, it's always is competitive, right? Because I'm trying to define myself as better than you or different, or, or I'm defining myself as, as worse off than you. Whatever, I'm, I'm trying to define myself. When, when I realize it, it takes a conscious step, as you said, to let go of that and to wake up and realize there's no re reason to compete. When I'm competing with Ashar, I'm, I'm actually fighting myself. That that is myself. So so it is a, it is a step of consciousness, and and it really is um, only when you're conscious that you're able to do it. This is when you go unconscious that you're that you then just fall back into the the default evolutionary psychology mode, and then we then we need of course to use capitalism and, and the free enterprise system to 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 make things work when everybody is saddled with the false self. <clears throat> 